talking to you about, uh, for example, hypothetically about assignments, uh, project reports. So I will share everything through uh, CMS, but I'll give you a heads up through WhatsApp group. Okay, so you are actually supposed to submit all those assignments, all those uh, uh, project reports through CMS. Uh, I will run it through uh, Turnitin. Okay, just to make sure that uh, everything is uh, your original contribution. And of course, then I will uh, grade it and I will share the grades uh, with you as well uh, through probably uh, through uh, email because we are not supposed to probably upload those uh, grades uh, through CMS. Um, lecture slides, again, I will upload them through. Do we have a CMS at all for, for this group or no? No, sir. Graduates ka CMS ni hota. Oh, okay. So my apology. So we will uh, actually I'll, uh, collect those assignments and project supports through my email. Then. Okay. So not, not a problem. Again, I'll share with you uh, PowerPoint slides through email. Mm, those PowerPoint slides, just like for from chapter number one to chapter number six. Uh, of course, it provides you a summary. It gives you only an indication of whatever we covered. Okay? It wouldn't be like very exhaustive uh, PowerPoint slide. So of course, if you are, let's say, reading for your final exam, uh, my expectation would be that you use PowerPoint slides, of course, uh, uh, maybe one day before your exam, right? As an indication of whatever we covered. Uh, but of course, if you read uh, book chapters, uh, they are more exhaustive. They are like more in detail. So hopefully, and of course, if you have any questions, you have my email. We have our WhatsApp group, so you can always contact me uh, anytime. In fact, I'll try to respond as soon as I can. Most of the time, I'm free. I'll be honest with you. Uh, I'm away from my family, so. Uh, I do not have like lots of time commitments uh, for, for other things. So I'm mainly focused on my teaching. So let's say if you have any questions, uh, the best way would be uh, drop a question uh, in WhatsApp group. What I experienced with my undergrad students, normally what they do, they send me questions uh, directly. OK. For you, and I also recommended it to them, please drop those questions on the group. Because learning, it's a two-way or three-way process. I learn from you, you learn from me, but at the same time, you also learn from each other, right? So if you pose a question on a common group, on a common platform, and of course, if we start discussing those questions on a common platform, your other colleagues will also benefit from that. Okay? Perfect. Okay. Uh, during this lecture, uh, let's say if you would like to mute yourself, uh, that's perfectly fine. Um, I will need only one student actually to to keep himself or her, herself uh, mute all, uh, unmute all the time. The reason is I'll be communicating with your group. So for example, let's say if I'm sharing my screen with you, normally I ask you, okay, can you see my screen? Okay. So 2031, uh, who is, uh, uh, who, who is this? Is it Hina uh, or is it uh, someone else? Ahmad, sir. Ahmad, sir. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Okay. So uh, who is going to volunteer to unmute him or herself all the time? And you get an extra credit for that. <laughs> Hi, sir. I can do that. You, you, who could do that? Sana. Sana. Perfect, Sana. Okay. All right. So let me share my PowerPoint slides. Oh. And uh, can you see my slides now, Sana? Yes, sir. Perfect. Okay. So, in today's lecture, what we are hoping to achieve today, 
two things. Number one, I will talk about some topics like for the first 40 minutes. Then we will have a 10 minutes break. And then after 10 minutes break, I'll talk about some other topics like for 40 minutes. In the first part of today's lecture, I'll give you a quick overview of what will be covered from chapter number one to chapter number six. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there's, there was a long gap, like close to one month. So I'm not expecting that you will remember each and everything, but if I give you a very, very quick uh, recap, of course, it will refresh uh, your memory. So if you remember, we started with chapter number one, which was introduction to corporate governance. So what we did, we started with two case uh, studies. OK, so we started with two case studies. And those case studies were specifically about those companies which failed. And the main reason of their failure was there was no checks and balances. OK, so the corporate governance itself, it's a system of actually checks and balances. OK, and in this chapter, we also cover that. Managers are self entrusted. So whenever there is a conflict between management's interest and the company's interest, normally managers as a human being, we are all self entrusted. We try to protect our interest. OK, sometimes what it does. While protecting their interest, it hampers actually shareholders. It, it, they affect actually shareholders in a bad way. OK, so managers protect their interests at the cost of shareholders. That is a typical agency problem. So whenever we talk about agency problem, OK, so we are talking about principal and agents. OK. So of course, principal in this situation are shareholders. OK, and. Management is working on behalf of the principal. So the principal, their own assets, their own assets. And. Agents in this case who are managers. They actually manage those assets. On behalf of principal, OK, so they're working as an agent. They are not the owners, but they're working as an agent. So whenever in an organization. And of course, all organizations have agency problems, OK? So self interested behavior, it actually triggers agency problem in which the managers try to protect their interest at the cost of shareholders. OK? So corporate governance actually addresses those agency problems. So corporate governance, as I said, it's a system of control mechanisms. And what this system of control mechanisms does, it actually increases the probability of detection. So let's say if something fishy is going on in a company, a good corporate governance system, a good control mechanisms, a set of control mechanisms, it increases the probability of its, its detection. And of course, it shifts the risk and reward balance so that the expected payoff of the crime is decreased. So in a way. The cost of crime. Is greater than. The benefit associated with it, so benefit of crime. OK. In chapter number two, I will expand uh, uh, these uh, these uh, mechanisms a little bit uh, further in the recap. So what corporate governance does, of course, it increases the probability of detection and it actually shifts the risk and reward balance. So the cost of crime is becomes more actually than the benefit of the crime. So it's like a deterrence. It acts as a deterrence. And then. In chapter number one, we also. 
did, I mean, we, we, we also went through some uh, literature review in which there is an evidence that investor pays premium for good, good corporate uh, governance uh, systems. So it's actually in the benefit of the company to have a good system of control mechanisms. And why? Because investors pay a premium on that. Companies who do not have good corporate governance systems, uh, then investors, of course, they're penalizing. And of course, we also covered uh, various factors which uh, shapes uh, governance system. In chapter number two, we covered those factors. Okay, so which factors actually shape the corporate governance system? So one was efficiency of local capital markets. Okay, and and if what can you tell me, Obed? You tell me. Uh, please unmute yourself. So if I'm talking about, let's say, efficiency of lo local capital markets, okay, how can it be a factor which is influencing a governance uh, system? Can you tell me the linkage? Can you give me a clue maybe only? So I think it was, it had something to do with the manipulation of assets. Sorry, say it again now, Obed. So I think it had something to do with the manipulation of the information. Okay. But sir, I don't remember exactly. It has been a long time. So, yes, that's okay. So whenever we talk about efficiency of local markets, okay, efficiency. So we talked about, let me remind you, pricing. Yes, sir. And then we also talk about, if you remember, arbitrage. Okay, apologize. Quick call. Hello, Assalamu alaikum. I'm a little bit busy with my students online lecture. There's a better colleague, my colleague. Oh, thank you very much. Sorry. Apologize for that. Okay, so Obed, do you have any idea now? So we talked about pricing, we talked about arbitrage. Okay? Yes. So let's say if local markets are efficient, there is no overpriced or underpriced securities. Do you remember now? Yes, sir. Okay. So how does this efficiency actually add uh, to the effectiveness of governance system? So the managers cannot overstate the value of something if it is actually down and uh, sell their sh their own shares from that company. Yes. Yes, in a way, yes. Okay. In other words, the local markets actually captures the true corporate governance system of that company. Because as we said, investors pay premium on good corporate governance systems, right? If there is no governance system, okay, they actually penalize it. So if there is efficiency in the capital markets, of course, it will accurately pay either premium or it will accurately actually penalize the company, right? So it's like a deterrent. So the incentive or the, or in other words, the disincentive of good corporate governance is actually coming from local capital markets, but those markets has to be efficient, okay? Do you also remember, let's say, if a, if in, in countries, let's say, in which capital markets are, capital markets efficient, and let's say there are other countries in where capital markets are inefficient. And do you remember that those countries where the capital markets are efficient normally if companies operating in those economies, if they need some capital, where do they go? Okay, I'll uh, ask now Aram to actually respond me on this one. Aram. Uh, sir, what do you mean when you say uh, where do companies go? Which market would they prefer? Okay, 
So let's say in those countries where the capital markets are relatively efficient, okay? So companies operating in those countries, let's say if they need extra capital, let's say if they would like to expand geographically and they need capital to finance uh, their future projects, what do they do? Where do they raise their capital from? Uh, please unmute yourself, uh, Aram. I'm sorry, I was on hard mute. Yeah. Uh, I was saying they uh, look towards in, uh, international financiers and investors to, uh, for expansions in other countries. Yeah, so they look to actually to the capital markets. So suppose they issue bonds, uh, they raise their capital to equity markets, okay? So they go to the formal sources, okay? Now, if we compare uh, it with those companies, let's say, which are operating in those countries, in which the capital markets are inefficient or let's say less efficient, less efficient, okay? What do they do? Uh, they go to the families, the uh, That's right. families that have more They revenue. go to the families or other maybe private capital providers, right? Yeah. Okay, so big families, right? Yes. So let's say, in those countries where the capital markets is less efficient, and if the company wants to expand and they need extra capital, right? They go to families. And whenever they raise capital from families, of course, they make a compromise on their corporate governance system because they there might is have hardly any need, let's say, for transparency. Okay? Most of the requirements for transparency are actually coming from your regulators. Okay, so let's say if a company is not listed on a stock exchange because they're raising their capital, let's say from families, uh, influential families, of course, with money, uh, they do not have to follow any regulations of the government because they're not listed on, let's say, stock exchange. Okay, so it adds actually to the inefficiency and then make a compromise on the governance systems. Okay, yes, sir. then extent to which the legal system provides protection to uh, all shareholders. Okay. Junaid. Do we have Junaid? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, perfect. Junaid, what do you make out of it? How does this factor actually shape the governance system of, uh, let's say, a company? And again, Think about, let's say, let me give you a hint. Some countries, they have good legal system, very effective, very robust, and very responsive. Okay. Effective, robust, responsive mm -hmm. legal system. Okay. Now compare it with those countries, let's say, where the rule of law is a little bit uh, weak. Okay. So so how does this fact actually shapes? the governance system. Sir, uh, stakeholder oriented and uh, shareholder oriented. Okay. But how does it affect? Can you can you tell me the link? At least try. Okay, so as I said, corporate governance system, what it does, it shifts the risk and reward balance. Shifts yes, the risk reward balance, right? Yes, sir. Okay, so let's say in countries where the legal system is weak, okay, so it <laughs> does not effectively shift the risk and reward balance because the legal system does not reward actually those companies with, which say, let's say, following the rule of law, or in other words, the flip side, they do not penalize those companies which do not follow the rule of law. Because the rule of law at the end of the day, it is actually to protect the shareholders. Okay? Yes. In countries where the legal system is weak, of course, if shareholders think that let's say the management did not take care, uh, I mean, did not act in their 
uh, benefit, right? Mm -hmm. Where did they go? Because the legal system is weak. And that legal system does not penalize management for, let's say, any, um, let's say, willful uh, wrongdoing, right? So yes, sir. if the legal system is weak, it does not uh, risk and it does not, I mean, uh, what should I say? Transfer the risk reward balance in favor of the shareholder, put it that way. Okay? Yes, sir. A reliability of accounting standards. Okay, Sana, you tell me, how does it contribute to, let's say, a governance uh, system? Um, uh, the accounting standards are defined in such a way that uh, they... I'm sorry, we, I, could, I cannot hear you properly. Can you hear me now? Uh, I think you should try a little bit harder. How about now? Yeah, it's, 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 it's okay now. Right. Uh, I was saying that the uh, accounting standards are used in such a way that the uh, system is or I think uh, mitigate karne ke liye jo hamari, we need a system of control so uh, accounting standards are also used for this purpose ke, uh, corporate governance jo hai, wo mazid, uh, refine hoti hai. okay accounting let, me, let me give you a hint uh, Sana. so yeah. accounting right so all companies let's say for example let's say if you're talking about uh, Pakistan right? all companies which are registered on a stock exchange, right? They have to share company's information with, with public, with shareholders and public, right? Yeah. And they share those information in the form of annual reports where financial statement is one of the most important uh, information that they share. And financial statements, we are specifically talking about balance sheet and income statement. Okay? okay, so companies have to share financial statements with its shareholders and with general public, right? So what if, let's say, those information are not reliable? Because at the end of the day, shareholders base their investment decision on these information. Mm -hmm. What if this information is not reliable? Of mm -hmm. course, they will make... They won't be able to trust uh, the company. That's right. So they will not be able to make their investment decision based on correct information. So they will make bad decisions, right? Got it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, enforcement of regulation, of course, is just like uh, the legal system. So I would uh, skip on this one. Societal and cultural norms. Like, for example, we talked about that in some countries, accumulation of wealth is actually considered as a social uh, table. People do not like actually talking about their, their wealth openly, right? In some countries, actually people show off, okay? So if, if the management or let's say, uh, if they're making uh, lots of money, they try to show off, right? So in those countries, let's say the incentive for management to make more and more money, okay, is more, right? And sometimes in that retrace, sometimes what they do, they resort to actually bad practices, okay? So, and especially self-entrusted behavior, what they do, they take decisions at the cost of the share, shareholders because their only purpose is to accumulate wealth, okay? And then try to show off. So one is, if you remember from first chapter, is self-entrusted behavior. And there was an opposite of it. What was it? A morality. Morality. And there is a specific word for it. Hena. Is Hena here? Oh, 
Okay. Moral salience. Okay, Hasid's mic is not working, so let's, uh, Feroz, you tell me, Feroz. Uh, sir, I think uh, Aram said it, mo moral salience, yes. Moral salience, perfect, Feroz. Thank you very much for that. Okay. Anyways, in the last part of chapter number two, what we did, I give you an assignment, okay, in which we covered the corporate governance structure of different companies and compared it. So as a general rule, if you see from country to country, all these factors, all these factors, they vary. So of course, the degree of capital market efficiency is different. Some countries have comparatively efficient markets and some countries have less efficient markets. OK, so all these factors starting like from market efficiency to legal systems, reliability of accounting standard and societal and cultural values, all these factors vary, vary, which means that the prevalence and severity of agency problem also vary. OK, and. Which results in the fact that the co corporate governance mechanisms to cope with those problems also vary. So one size does not fit all. So a code of go corporate governance for one country may not be a good fit for, let's say, for another country. Yes, some of the standards are universal, uh, but broadly speaking, a set of corporate governance for one country may or may not be as effective for any other country. Is it clear? Yes. OK, in uh, chapter number three, what we did, we talked about board of directors, its duties and liabilities. OK, so the OECD. Defined corporate governance and the board of directors. So if you go by the definition, the corporate governance framework as per OECD should ensure strategic guidance, effective mon monitoring of uh, management, and the board's accountability to the company and the shareholders. So BOD actually, as per this, this definition, has two broader roles, okay? And all the chapters actually talk about these roles. Board of director has advisory role and they have a monitoring or supervisory role, okay? So in chapter number three, we talk in detail how do they perform these advisory roles and supervisory roles. Chapter number four, okay? Board of Directors, Selection, Compensation, and Removal, okay? So, most of the companies around the world, they're looking actually to diversify their boards, okay? And whenever we talk about diversity, it's actually ethnic and gender diversity, as well as ethnic. Uh, educational as well. So educational or experience. OK, so they would like to bring diversity in terms of ethnic, gender uh, characteristics, and of course, uh, education and experience. Oh, expertise is already here. And there is a research actually to back uh, to back actually the demand for diversity. And the research is that boards which are diverse in terms of experience, they actually outperform other companies. OK, so that's why companies are looking for diverse boards. The demand for diversity is increasing day by day. We, we talked about four different types of directors, OK? One is active CEO, OK? So, Obed, can you tell me what is active CEO? So, active CEO is a CEO of one company, and he's also serving as a, a BOD member in some other company. He's also, he or she is also working on the board, OK? Directors with international experience, OK? Why is this international experience important? So if you OK, Aaron, you tell me, why is this international experience important? 
uh, when we're talking about expansion, especially to other countries, uh, the original countries, people may not be aware of the culture or how the operations work in different countries. So someone with the international experience would be better suited to lead those operations. Perfect, bingo, nice. And what else? Junaid, can you tell me what else? Sir, I just local capital market. Sir, yes. Sir, I find these uh, political and social connections because of international expansion. So, that's why I'm helpful. I'm sorry. Is it me only that uh, I'm trying it to try? Uh, I mean, I'm finding it a little bit difficult to actually to. Can can you say it again? I couldn't hear you. Just social and political uh, connections of FIDs help us in expansion and. Yes. So yes, experience. So, yes, it, it gives you, let's say, the, it gives a board ability, let's say, to understand uh, the dynamics of uh, those uh, countries, there, let's say, where they are trying to expand, okay? And it also actually helps you uh, create, let's say, a good uh, network. So, suppose, let's say, if, our, if you are in a licensing stage, uh, assume, let's say, if a U.S. company would like to expand uh, into, into Pakistan, of course, they would like to hire an influential director here where uh, those individuals, let's say, can connect their company to the right uh, people. OK, so they use their connections actually to their uh, advantage, for example, uh, in terms of registration, licensing and stuff like that. OK, yes, sir. now directors with specialized knowledge. OK. Sometimes, let's say, if a company is going through a merger, okay, you need some specialized uh, knowledge for that, okay? You need someone on your board, uh, let's say, who has, let's say, experienced, uh, let's say, mergers and uh, acquisition in the past, or let's say, since mergers and acquisition, it's 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 a very very complex uh, transaction, and you need a very very powerful uh, legal team, okay? Just to protect uh, your interests. Okay, so sometimes I mean you go for a legal expert, right, to 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 uh, lead the whole process. Okay, diverse uh, directors, of course, diverse in terms of ethnic and gender diversity and in terms of expertise. Okay, one type of directors we talked about they are let's say gaining more and more importance uh, uh, these days. Who are those directors? Sana. Uh, sir, a hint maybe. Sorry? I don't remember. Can you please don't give Don't remember. That's okay. Make a guess. Make an educated guess. Uh, female directors? Female, yes. But I'm looking for a different thing. That's the advantage of being a teacher, actually. <laughs> okay, so I open the floor. Anyone with a guess? Maybe directors who are working on two different boards. Who are uh, working on two different boards? Yeah, more than one board. They are, they are having on diverse sphere. Okay. Multiple boards. Yeah, multi. So maybe the most sort sorry my way. point actually is more uh, with this specialized knowledge so my question is if you remember i asked you this question what type of directors and it's also related actually to diversity as well so give me a guess directors with what kind of knowledge are let's say high in demand these days take directors who? Sorry? Sir, so tech directors, like directors from the IT by background. Okay. 
digital directors digital directors yes okay and in the last part of chapter number 4 uh we talked about mechanisms for directors compensation evaluation and uh, removal of course directors can be removed but for all practical purposes if you remember from my lecture they are hardly removed actually the removal is in a way their contract is not renewed okay so they are not given an extension that is in a way like a removal for a director okay uh and there is a reason for it if a director is removed it sometimes sends a bad signal to the market right so sometimes they think that okay we wouldn't do that but what we will do if actually their tenure expires we will not renew his or her uh let's say uh for another term so that's kind of removal okay in chapter number 5 we talked about uh bod structure and uh, of course its uh, consequences so whenever we talk about structure okay we talk about some structural features for example let's say size independence committees diversity etc okay so let's say if i give you a company an annual report of a company okay for example uh ptcl or let's say oj ojdcl okay or any other company agrochemicals okay and i tell you okay can you please comment on its uh, uh structure on uh, bod structure okay so if i talk about structure it means that i would like you to comment on some of its structural features for example size how many let's say uh, directors number of directors okay how many of them are let's say independent okay uh how many committees uh, does these uh, let's say the board of directors have to support their function okay and we talked about two different types of committees okay amat can you tell me how many committees i said two different types of committees what are those two types amat can you hear me Okay, Shahzil, can you tell me what type of committees? Sir, name I forgot exactly. I forgot. One is the one that does audit, etc. There is an audit committee. Hoti hai. Those are like yeah, yeah. Those are the committees, but those are not the type of committees. Sir, that is exactly what I forgot. मतलब वो चीजें याद हैं मतलब जो इनके एक तो इनका ऑडिट करती है इनका मतलब इनको हायर फायर करने के लिए होती है दूसरा इनको ऑडिट करती है ओके मेंशन से याद है सर एक स्टैंडिंग कमिटीज कैन बी एक्चुअली मेड फॉर एनी पर्पस फॉर एग्जांपल ऑडिट कमिटी इज मैंडेटेड बाय अह व्हाट्स इट कॉल्ड सिक्योरिटी बाय सिक्योरिटी एंड एक्सचेंज कमीशन इन द यूएस अह इट्स mandated in pakistan as well so it's not a choice you have to do it okay there are two types of committees sana can you tell me what type of committees uh, independent committees and uh, sorry which committees independent committees and independent Okay, uh, Aram, can you please tell me on this for two specific purposes? Ad hoc and standing committees. Yes, ad hoc and standing committees. Now, Sana, tell me what are ad hoc committees? As the name suggests, I mean, these are based on need basis, uh, created on need basis whenever a requirement is formed. The ad hoc committee is formed for that. Yeah, so they are actually transactional in nature. Transaction is over; these committees are dissolved. These are standing committees. Okay, standing are like permanent committees. They actually help uh, board of directors actually in their strategic uh, decision making. Okay, we talked about independent and uh, non-independent chairman of the board. Then we talked about lead independent director. 
Okay, Obev, can you tell me what is lead independent director? Sir, if the CEO of the company is also serving as a chairman of the board, then there is an independent director, director that is uh, head of the independent directors who presides over executive sessions. That member is known as lead independent director. So the directors who lead the executive sessions. Yes, sir. If the okay. So those are lead independent directors. Okay, Shazil, what what are executive sessions? Executive sessions, sir, just my matlab, uh, sorry, matlab, a specific topic discussion. Exactly, sir. Yeah, I'm not going to give it a try. Sir, executive sessions, my child, my vote, and just my vote. Sir, good to them. That's okay. Feroz. Sir, in which the governing body uh, does a meeting among the, themselves? Where the governing council meets? Uh, the... the the governing body uh, have a meeting among themselves to discuss uh, some issues or future plans for the company. I, I think you got it. But you have to be a little bit more specific. Okay, in these sessions, someone is absent. Executive members. Executive, executive members. Okay. So executive members are absent. They are not part of the meeting. Okay. So and why did they need actually need independent directors? The reason is that there was a debate between independent and independent, non-independent chairman of the board, okay? So let's say in companies in which the CEO is also DOD chairman, okay? There are lots of problems associated with it, but also lots of benefits associated, okay? We talked about like the ease of decision-making process, right? their ability to understand the business, right? These are very, very uh, huge advantages of uh, non-independent chairman, okay? CEO as a board uh, chairman, okay? The research actually suggests that if a CEO is chairman of the board, it has a positive impact on company's profitability, right? So it is actually in the interest of the company to keep CEO as uh, board of directors uh, chairman, okay? But there are some, for example, let's say, uh, since CEO, if you remember, they have the ability to schedule the meetings, okay? And they also evaluate the performance. So how would they evaluate the performance of someone who is actually heading the board of directors? Okay, so they thought that, okay, let's keep CEO as board chairman, but we will have executive sessions and someone will lead that those uh, sessions. And then we will have, let's say, a very candid uh, discussion about management's uh, performance. Okay, so lead independent director, it's actually like a very innovative uh, creation in a way that yes, they wanted CEO as a board chairman, but at the same time, they did not want CEOs to influence, let's say, uh, the oversight function. Okay. Is it clear? Okay. It's clear. We talked about, of course, independent and independent directors, busy boards. Okay. Now, busy boards, as, as, I, as I mentioned before, board has two roles. And what are those two roles with? Advisory rule and supervisory rule. Perfect. Advisory and supervisory. Okay. So busy boards are, let's say, a busy director. Busy director. So it is, 
Busy directors are those individuals who work on more than three or more boards. So let's say if a director, if he or she is on a board of three or more companies, they are called busy directors. If majority of the directors on a certain board, if they are busy, those boards are called busy boards. So let's say if majority of directors, majority of directors are busy. And busy, busy, I'm not using it like a typical English word. It's like a technical word, right? In corporate uh, governance, let's say if somebody uh, is telling me that, okay, the director is busy, it doesn't mean that he's, he or she is busy right now. It means that they're working actually on three or more board of directors, okay? So if the, the, the board itself is busy, which means that the majority of directors are busy, okay? They actually are making a compromise on its supervisory role. Advisory, yes, they can still be effective because they are bringing lots of experience from other companies, okay? But they compromise on supervisory role. And as the name suggests, they're also busy working like for three or more boards, so they do not spend more time actually on their supervisory role. Interlock boards, IRM. What are those boards? Sir, interlock boards are where uh, if a director is uh, working on uh, one company's board, uh, as a c if a CEO of one company is a director on another company's board, uh, the other company's CEO would then uh, be serving as a director on the first company's board. Perfect. Okay. So let's say company A uh, executive is working on company's B board and companies B executive is working on companies A board. There are some advantages and there are some disadvantages uh, to it, right? And the disadvantages is mostly the supervisory part of it, okay? You stretch my back, I stretch yours, okay? So you do not, let's say, uh, pinpoint my, let's say, weaknesses, I will not pinpoint your weaknesses, okay? And of course, there are diverse boards uh, as well. Chapter number six, this particular uh, image actually summarizes the whole chapter really, really well, right? So if you see the strategic development and oversight process, management actually proposes the corporate strategy, right? And we always, always emphasize the fact that the board of directors never formulates actually a strategy, okay? They do not go into micro details, okay? So the management proposes a corporate strategy, okay? And the board of directors actually reviews it. And if they are reviewing it, which role is it? Where? The supervisory so let's say board of directors has two roles. Yes, advisory right. and... Supervisory. Supervisory. So let's say if a board of director is reviewing a certain corporate strategy, okay, are they playing the advisory role or supervisory role? So they are playing the advisory role. Advisory role, perfect. Okay. And it's the responsibility of the management actually to develop business model. Because corporate strategy is how do you create value, okay? And business model tells you actually the linkages where the corporate strategy is translated into that value, okay? So management develops that business model and the board of directors actually test. There is a very, very uh, interesting case study actually in the book. It's not a case study, but actually they mentioned about a corporate strategy of a company, and then they actually tested their business model. So there was a company which thought that the way they create value is actually to customer satisfaction. Okay, if the customers are satisfied, of course they will come for repeat business, right? So for example, let's say if you are talking about uh, a franchise, let's say McDonald's. Okay, so the customer 
if they're satisfied with McDonald's, okay, they will come back and do a repeat business with them. But satisfaction with what? Okay. Then they said that, okay, customers will be only satisfied if employees of the company are satisfied. Okay, because they ensure customers' uh, satisfaction. The level of customer service they provide, uh, the food that they serve, it all boils down to employees' satisfaction. Okay, and there are like two layers of employees. One is like the, the what, 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 what's it called, the white color management, and the other are the workers. Okay, so yes, they developed a corporate strategy where they thought that customer satisfaction is something which creates value, okay? And then they create actually a causal model, right? The causality that, okay, how would that causality happen? Okay, what are the linkages uh, which actually creates customer satisfaction? They thought that actually it's employees, okay? So whenever the management develops a business model, the board of director has to test it. So in that particular case, actually they did not test that. So what really happened, they although increased employees' salaries, they actually did a very good training of them. They did also uh, something else, which increased actually employees' satisfaction, but it did not translate into customer satisfaction. Do you see my point? Initially, they thought that employees satisfaction leads to customer satisfaction. But after some time when they tested it, actually there was no relationship. OK, and where they, when they did actually a detailed analysis, they thought they actually found out that it's not. The, and how did they measure actually employee satisfaction through turnover? Right. So in certain branches, let's say McDonald's branches, let's say one is Faisalabad branch, the other one is, let's say, Islamabad, the other one is, let's say, Lahore, Shower, right? If the turnover among the employees is low, they thought that, okay, these employees are satisfied. But when they tested the model, there was no linkage between employee satisfaction and customer satisfaction. And when they started digging it, digging it, dig it, when they dig it further, they found out that actually it's the management turnover which affects the customer satisfaction. So rather than emphasizing employees satisfaction, they actually started focusing on management satisfaction. OK, and they came, came up with a different uh, different uh, plan. OK, and then what happened actually, it really increased the satisfaction of the customers and actually as a result, the profitability increased. OK, so the point of the discussion is whenever the management develop a causal business model okay it's the responsibility of the board to actually test it that whether the causality holds okay now management identifies some key performance indicators okay of course you need some indicators whether your business model is actually leading to achieving your corporate strategy. Those key performance indicators, board of directors monitors them. Okay. At the end, risk management, which is a very, very exciting uh, field. And whenever I talk about risk management, it's identification of risk, but you identify risk. And in the second stage, what do you do? You quantify it, you measure it. OK, so let's say if the if you identify the risk, but the risk is very low, right? Sometimes you do not even care. Because in order to mitigate the risk, of course, you have to introduce an internal control mechanism. Or in other words, a control mechanism. And whenever you introduce control mechanism, it increases your cost. OK, so let's say if you identify a risk and let's say whenever you measure the risk and you think now oh, the risk is low, I don't care. 
Okay. And the third stage is, of course, you have to come up with a mitigation strategy. Okay. So the whole process is called risk management. So what happens, let's say, what can go wrong? So management also identifies that. Okay. So let's say, for example, let's say if you are chairman of PIA, Pakistan International Airline, or let's say chairman of any other, let's say, uh, airline company, right? One of the risk factors that affect actually uh, severely, in fact, uh, affect your profitability is oil prices. OK, so what do you do with that? OK, so you sometimes you hedge those. Like you buy futures. Uh, you come up with a strategy actually to mitigate uh, the risk. So identification of risk. I mean, the risk management process, the whole process, actually, identification, measurement, and the mitigation. It's the responsibility of the management, and the reviewing is the responsibility of the board. So whenever a board reviews something, they're actually playing their advisory role. If they're testing something, what do they do? Is it supervisory or is it advisory? Supervisory. How is it advisory? You're testing it. You're supervising it. OK, monitoring is also. Supervisory. Uh, what's this called? Uh, supervisory. A review can be either supervisory or advisory, or it can be both. Because once you review it, sometimes you also give your recommendations, right? Based on your experience, if you are, let's say, sitting on a board, you also give them uh, a direction where you think that, okay, it will effectively mitigate uh, a risk, okay? So I will stop here. We will take actually a 10 minutes break, and then I will quickly talk about maybe 15 minutes, the first part of our, uh, or do you want me to continue? Sir, I guess you continue. Continue? Yes. Continue, sir. Okay, so the decision is continue. Just do that. Okay. Now, chapter number seven, we will be talking about labor markets for executives and CEO succession planning. Okay. This is our new topic. So whenever we talking, we talk about market. Labor market. So whenever we talk about market, we are actually talking about demand, demand, and supply. Okay. So there is a company, and let's say if they are looking for a chief executive, of course they do their need assessment. That what kind of skills, what kind of individual are they looking for? Okay. So this is the demand side. And then, of course, there are individuals who are looking, let's say, for certain jobs. Uh, for example, let's say, if it's like a top-notch executive, they may be interested, let's say, to take up any position, let's say, at Google, or let's say, at uh, Microsoft, or, or let's say, any other company, right? So there is an inherent demand in the market, and there is an inherent supply of talent in the market. So whenever we talk about the labor market, okay, just like a physical market, what do we do? People who need stuff, they go to the market, and people who would like to sell something, they also put those things on display in the market, right? So in the labor market for CEOs, what the market does, it's actually a process which matches the demand with supply, okay? Uh, any other market, for example, capital market, right? If, let's say, a company is looking to raise some capital, right? They issue bonds, right? So what they do? They're looking for capital. So there is a demand for money, demand for capital. And of course, investors. Investors are suppliers of capital. Okay? So the whole point is, whenever 
we see a work market, the first thing which should come to your mind is actually demand and supply, right? And then you match those people, uh, or let's say, who demand something with those individuals who supply those. Let's say it may be a talent, it may be expertise, it may be a physical good. For the labor market to function efficiently, now again, efficiently, okay? Information must be available on the needs of the corporation and the skills of the individuals applying to serve in executive roles. So it is actually the responsibility of the company to identify those skills that they are looking for. Okay? And it is the responsibility of those individuals actually to share their uh, skills on a certain platform. For example, let's say LinkedIn. It's like a marketplace. It's like an Amazon for skills, okay? Some people are selling their skills and some people are buying those skills, okay? So let's say if you are appearing in your first job interview, individual in front of you is actually buying your skills and you're selling your skills, okay? Now the efficiency of this market, so let's say efficiency, the market will be efficient if the company accurately identify the skills that they are looking for, okay, and the individuals who are selling their skills, they accurately actually identify those skills as well, okay? And what the market does, the market actually then matches those skills uh, with each other, okay? So the efficiency of this market has implication for governance. For example, improved hiring decisions. Okay, so imagine a situation where the company knows the skills that they're looking for and they find someone with the matching skill. Of course, it's, it's, it's a win-win situation for both. Okay, so improved hiring decisions is a result of, let's say, efficient uh, capital, uh, labor market, not capital, but labor market. Okay. Incentives to perform. Now, labor market actually creates an incentive to perform. So those individuals who are underperforming, okay, those will be penalized. In terms of, let's say, they will be either replaced, okay, uh, or uh, sometimes they're actually asked to leave. They are not removed, but they are asked to leave. Asked to leave is something that does not send like as bad a signal to the market as let's say if somebody is terminating. Okay, so labor market actually provides an incentive for those individuals who are outperforming others. And how? Like for example, I was looking this morning, uh, Sundar Pichai, like the chief executive of uh, Google. This gentleman is making $281 million in a year, which is more than $23 million per month. And he is close to 47 years old. Okay, so let's say if a company thinks that, okay, this particular individual will help us achieve our corporate strategy means that this individual will help us, let's say, create value according to the expectation of shareholders. They pay incentive to those individuals or they pay incentive to attract those uh, individuals. Uh, but let's say if, if, if they find out that, okay, this individual is not performing according to our expectations, of course, they are either asked to leave or they are terminated of their contract. Okay? One of the one of the clauses normally what uh, the CEO's uh, contract have that those individuals are given stock options. Okay, so stock options give an inherent incentive where those individuals like the CEOs, they actually act in the best interest of the company or the shareholders. Okay, and one of the one of the clause sometimes, not always, but sometimes says that let's say in order to 
get benefit of those stock options. Uh, this is the minimum performance standards that you 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 need uh, to to meet. Okay, so if you do not meet those uh, performance standards, of course you they are. Not, uh, I mean, you as as the chief executive are not given those uh, stock options. So stock options, yes, uh, it's an incentive to uh, act in the benefit of the shareholders, but also it's like a deterrence uh, in the sense that let's say if you do not achieve your targets, you, you are not given actually those uh, stocks. Okay. Appropriate compensation. If market is uh, efficient, of course, uh, they will attract uh, individuals that they are looking for at a price, at a fair price. So efficient market will always, just like for physical commodities, it will ensure a fair price. So let's say if a CEO is worth, let's say, $1 million. Okay. And let's say I'm talking about let's say monthly package. Okay, so efficient markets will actually ensure that this individual actually gets one million dollars. If the market is not efficient, this individual may get actually 1.2 or 0.0.7 million. Okay, so it will not be a fair price. It will be the individual will be either overpriced or underpriced. Okay. And if the market is inefficient, executives will be matched to the jobs, let's say, um, to the wrong jobs, put it that way. Okay, so the matching process will not work efficiently. Now, challenges to the labor, or labor market efficiency. There are, of course, some challenges. One of the most important challenge is skill set of those individuals is very, very difficult to evaluate. OK. So some individuals, even if they claim that, OK, they have achieved this much, let's say in their previous uh, roles, it's very, very difficult to evaluate because you as an individual, let's say if this executive. Especially is coming from outside. And let's say you do not have an experience of, let's say, leading this executive or let's say supervising this executive or even let's say if you did not work with this executive you do not know about that individual much right whatever skills that they share with you it's very difficult to evaluate okay so this is one of the challenges actually for the labor market efficiency evaluation okay success in previous company or role may not translate into new position Sometimes some individuals may be very successful in their previous roles, but those roles and those are those successes, put it that way, those successes, or let's say that success was achieved in a certain in a certain environment. So each company has a certain environment, right? So let's say if you hire those individuals for your own company, so of course the environment is different. It's a different environment. OK, which means that his or her skills may not be translated into. Performance anymore. It may or may not. Be. Can you see uh, that point, uh, Aaron? Yes, sir. Perfect. Can you see that point, uh, Junaid? Yes, sir. And Feroz? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. perfect. I see, but unfortunately, I mean, he, he has a broken uh, microphone. So. Anyways, the labor market is limited by its size and by ability of executives to move among and within companies. OK, so a labor market is limited by size. Which means. That. The companies are looking for a certain uh, skill set. OK, and in order to find, let's say, matching uh, executives, it's difficult. Like, for example, let's say I can tell you like first time experience. I mean, we, we, we uh, talk about this uh, all the time for institutes like GAK. 
it's very difficult for them actually to hire uh, quality uh, teachers, professors. Although, I mean, there are lots of PhDs uh, in the market, but the kind of skills that they're looking for, they're, they're finding it difficult actually to find quality uh, teachers and professors. Okay, now companies are not uniform in their circumstances or hiring practices. Now, internal promotion versus external candidate. Okay, so sometimes it's because of the hiring practice, but sometimes it's also the circumstances. Okay, for example, this one is a hiring practice. Some companies by principle, okay, they would like to promote internally. Okay. And those companies are normally successful companies. They are successful companies. So for example, let's say if Google would like to make a succession plan for their chief executive, normally they are looking for internal promotions. They are not, not looking outside. Okay. So for some company, it's like a hiring practice. And as I said, the decisions of going internal or external Normally, it's because if a company is successful, they're OK, let's say, with hiring internal, uh, internally because they think, OK, the individual knows about the environment of the company. They know the business. Uh, and I think Google is one of those companies who are encouraging their uh, employees internally and they promote them to chief executive positions. But companies, let's say, who are struggling or let's say if a company is entering into a new business. Uh, for example, let's say Tesla, all of a sudden they think that instead of, let's say, focusing only on, let's say, uh, full electric cars, uh, they should also go, let's say, for combustion engines, just for the sake of discussion. Although they are not going back, but I'm only just for the sake of example. They may look for an external candidate because they are entering into a new line of business and they would like to hire someone who knows the business. OK, or let's say if a company is less successful, they would like to bring someone in, let's say, turn around the company. OK. Now, sound operating condition versus turn turnaround situation. OK, now this is a circumstance. OK, some companies may be operating uh, very, very profitably, like for many, many years. For example, Facebook, Microsoft again, Google, right? In Pakistan, for example, let's say Anglo Fertilizers, right? Or GDCL. Okay. These are very, very solid companies, right? So some companies may be, op may be operating, let's say, very profitably for many, many years. And some companies may need, let's say, a turnaround, right? So whether to hire internally or externally, it really depends on these facts, on the operating conditions of those uh, companies. Long scheduled retirement or sudden transition. OK. Like, for example, some comp like, for example, uh, unfortunately, I mean, that poor guy uh, from uh, Apple, he died, he passed away, right? His health condition did not allow. So it was a sudden transition. OK. So the kind of situations that the companies face that actually they're not uniform. And they are not uniform based on the circumstances or their own practices. OK. If I give you some statistics. On average. Executives spend 14 years. With a company. With one company. I'm talking about executives, not CEOs. OK. CEOs on average spend five years in a company. OK, and this is actually the breakup. So 57 percent actually they spend zero to five years and then six to 10 years, 25 percent. And then so a good number of actually CEOs. They spend five years or less as a CEO in a certain company. And this is their previous prior experience. OK, 22 percent has prior experience in finance. So they had experience of managing finance operations. 
Okay. Twenty uh, percent had experience with operations. Uh, 20% marketing and then 5% engineering. So engineering people are normally very technical. Okay. Chief executives, normally they promote those individuals who brought a macro perspective, right? Like for example, operations. If you are talking about operations, right? It's related with the operations of all companies, all business units of that uh, company. So these individuals actually bring a broader perspective to the company. OK, so that's why these individuals, they have a higher chances of being promoted as chief executives. Okay. In terms of education. Now, if you see. Undergraduate, their degrees were in engineering. OK, but these individuals, it's a very, very common practice. Normally they uh, these individuals go and let's say uh, get their MBA done, or let's say some certifications, uh, they uh, or economics or any other degree, right? But most of the time, they're for for CEOs, their undergraduate degree was engineering. Okay, economics was fifteen percent, business was thirteen percent, and if you see here, MBAs forty percent, and if there may be overlap, it should not add up actually to hundred. It will not add up to hundreds. OK. I'm talking about those individuals who are chief executives. Their undergrad was 21 percent. They may have obtained an MBA degree afterwards as well. OK. CEO turnover. OK, so CEO turnover is approximately 14 percent per year on global basis. OK. And it has significantly increased compared to last decade. OK, so what it really means actually that the turnover is increasing day by day. OK, CEO turnover is inversely proportional to the performance, and this is the way it should be. If performance is good, CEO turnover should be low. So performance is more, turnover is low. Performance is less, Turnover should be high and their turnover CEOs who underperform are more likely to be terminated. OK, I mean, as a CEO, normally the expectation is that either you will, let's say if it's a successful company, so you will maintain actually the good performance of your company. But let's say if an individual is hired to turn around the company and let's say if he or she is unable to turn around the company, of course, their contract is they are terminated. They were hired for a particular purpose and they did not actually achieve those uh, objectives, so they are terminated. CEO tur turnover is not very sensitive. OK, so here we established that there is inverse proportionality. But the sensitivity is not that high. And if you see here, the top performing companies, the return on asset is 12%. The CEO termination rate is 0.8%. Yes, there is a positive relationship. OK, here if you see the return on investment on underperforming companies, it means that the company were making losses. That's why the return on asset is less. Uh, I mean, in negative, right? The termination rate is 2.7%. So termination rate is high. So yes, we established that. Sorry, inverse proportionality. So inverse proportionality exists. But if you see the sensitivity, it's, it's not very sensitive to performance. So for example, let's say if it's 0.8% here, the turnover, I was expecting more here. And it's not that much. OK. So yes. The performance and the CEO turnover is inversely related to each other, but it's not that significant. Just to summarize it. For you. OK, these are the CEO turnovers over the years. OK, so starting from 2000 to 2000 and so 
5, 10, so this is okay. 6, 7, 8, and 10. Okay, so 1, 11, 12, 30. This is 20, 30. Okay, so if you see most, let me change the color of my. So most of the CEOs, the turnover is actually planned, right? So every company has a succession planning. They give their CEO heads up that, okay, this is your last term. And after, let's say you retire, we are going to hire someone else, right? So that's a planned uh, retirement. Or let's say the CEO, he or she uh, intimates the board of directors that, okay, this is time to retire, okay? So that is something planned. OK. But some individuals are actually forced to leave. OK, because they because of any reason, because of, let's say, transparency issues or because of, let's say, uh, underperformance or anything. OK. They're forced to leave. And some of the chief executives are actually let go because of the merger and acquisition. So let's say if a certain company acquires another company, okay, the company which is acquired, that CEO, let's say for example, is no more uh, needed. He is asked to leave, okay? So some of the employees are also asked to leave and the chief executive is also asked uh, to leave. So if you see a major portion of the turn or is because of the plant, and if, as you can see with the passage of time, actually the portion of planned turnover is becoming high and high, okay? Which, which is good actually for the industry. So this is not something abrupt, something which is not forced upon, but this is something very planned. Some evidence exists that companies with strong governance are more likely to terminate and underperforming CEOs, CEO. And those companies, they are not busy. Uh, sorry, boards, okay? So if a board is not busy, so board not busy. If a board is not busy, it is very likely that underperforming CEOs are terminated. But let's say, conversely, if the boards are busy, I didn't order. Nothing. Monkey over there. Let's not go down. Charlie, a bit till from the villa. A bit that particular. If boards are busy, it is unlikely for them to terminate an underperforming CEO. Not unlikely, comparatively less likely. That is a more correct uh, way of uh, saying it. Okay. So board of directors with high percentage of outside directors. So a board which has a highest percentage of outside directors means which is a relatively, a relatively more independent. They are more likely to terminate underperforming CEOs. Now you tell me, this is very, very logical. If somebody is not performing, he or she should be terminated as a CEO, right or wrong? Right. Okay. So let's say if boards are, boards are not busy, which means that they can focus more on their supervising role, Right? They are more likely to terminate underperforming CEOs. Similarly, more independent, independent boards are more likely to terminate underperforming CEOs. So it means corrective, it's like terminating underperforming CEO. It's it's like a corrective action. Yes or no? Yes. Okay, so again. Boards which are not busy, they are more likely to take corrective action. 
independent boards are more likely to take corrective action. And what is that corrective action? I already defined it for you. Directors own large percentage of shares. And let's say if the directors have a large percentage of shares, if they own a large percentage of the company, of course, they are main stakeholders. If they are mixed and stakeholders, they will take corrective action. They will more likely take uh, the corrective action. Shareholders base concentrated among handful of institutions. So the pressure of terminating underperforming CEOs, they are also coming from those institutions who are stakeholders of that company. Okay. So it's actually from the last two are actually from the ownership. Okay. So the owners are more likely to take corrective action more promptly compared to others. Okay. Shareholders react positively to news that underperforming CEOs terminated and it tests with an outsider. Okay. So whenever the investors or the stock stock market, investors, let's say sitting in the stock market, if they get this information that the underperforming CEO is terminated and replaced with an outsider, outsider, okay, it sends a positive signal to the market. Now everything is so interconnected that boards which are not busy, directors who are independent, and directors who have a major stake, they're more likely to terminate underperforming CEOs. And they do that because investors react positively to such action. So it's a win-win situation. You get rid of underperforming CEOs because the shareholders react positively to, it, to such uh, decisions. Okay, and this is, as I said, this is consistent with the theory that independent oversight reduces agency cost and management entrenchment. Newly appointed CEOs. Most newly appointed CEOs are internal executives, 80, 80%. Okay, and there is a, a, a reason for it because these individuals, they know the business. Okay. They know the inside and outside of the business. Okay. They know their environment. Okay. Companies with strong performance are more likely to select an insider. As I said earlier, companies were successful. Okay. They mostly focus on internal promotions. They do not go for hiring an outside CEO. Companies who select an internal CEO tend to exhibit superior market adjusted return post succession. Okay, so whenever they, for example, let's say Sundar Pichai, right? So whenever Google selected, let's say, an internal CEO, the market adjusts accordingly and their return is even superior to that. Why? Because the investor thinks that since Google has inducted an internal CEO, it means that the Google performance is very superior because it's a common knowledge. Companies with superior performance, they tend to hire internal CEOs. Once you hire an internal CEO, it sends a signal to the market that the performance of this company is very good, which means that the market adjusted return in post succession, it's higher. It's superior. Okay, is it logical, Obed? Yes, but obviously it is logical, but because uh, it means that a company is doing everything right. They don't need somebody else to come and do something go better for them. So yes, so this is logical, pretty logical, right? Yes, sir. Okay, internal CEOs receive lower first year total compensation, and this is something that, for me. It's 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 really hard actually to to uh, to what should I say to to digest it. Uh, but there is one possible explanation for it. For example, if a CEO is accepting a position within the company, so let's say a CEO is working in a certain company and he or she is offered let's say 
a CEO position. They actually accept sometimes those positions at a lower first year compensation because they also know the company and they have their own comfort zone. They have better ideas. They think that, okay, I can actually implement my ideas and actually keep the company on the right uh, track or maybe improve, it, further improve the per performance of that company. So there is an intrinsic incentive for them to actually accept those positions, even at a lower first year total compensation. And the reason for my confusion was that here we say that, okay, internal CEOs are, I mean, the COOs, CEOs are internally hired on those companies uh, which are strong, which are historically strong. Why would they offer, let's say, a lower first year total compensation to their own uh, CEOs? In my opinion, it's not about like them offering uh, the CEOs a lower package. It's actually the willingness of the new CEO where they take the new job as a challenge, where they think that, okay, they can implement their ideas and further improve uh, the, perf the performance of their company. External CEOs must be bought out of uh, contracts. And there is another reason. So they, they, they also tell that, okay, if the company is looking for an external CEO, of course, every CEO has a contract. Right, and you cannot leave a contract, okay? And in order to buy those CEOs out of their contracts, which means in order to hire those CEOs, okay, sometimes you have to compensate them because these individuals are required, let's say if they do not give a prior notice to the company, they are asked to give uh, some sort of like penalty to the company, right? So in order to buy those CEOs out of their contract, it's much costly for them. It's costly. Okay, so instead they go for an internal hire. They hire somebody internally. Companies in poor, poor financial condition to pay more to attract actually uh, the right uh, candidate. Why would somebody take a challenge? Let's say if a company is underperforming and the research suggests that, let's say, if you do not turn around the company, uh, their contract is actually normally terminated. So why would somebody accept the position in a company whose performance is already bad? Okay. Now, in order to attract uh, solid individuals, like experienced individuals who can take up that position, of course, you have to provide them more incentives. Is that logical, uh, Aaron? It does sound logical, sir. Uh, yes, go ahead, uh, Iram. No, no, nothing at all. Okay, perfect. So I will stop here. You can ask me, I'll uh, open the floor for you. Uh, please unmute yourself. If you have any confusion, any question, uh, please raise that. So any questions? Uh, sir, in the previous slide, sir, you mentioned that uh, some CEOs are forced to leave the uh, company. Yes. So in the in the previous chapters, we studied that forcing the executives or the board of directors uh, to leave their jobs is actually not good for the company uh, company because it brings it uh, sends a bad signal to the shareholders. Yes. So, yeah, that was that was actually, if you remember, that was for the board of directors. Okay, sir. That was for the board of directors. Okay. Sir. Okay. So the con, uh, the the term of the board of uh, directors is not renewed, and not okay. renewing it is actually like a removal for them. Okay. But here, yeah. if if a company is underperforming, and let's say if a CEO is replaced by an outsider. The market actually looks very positive uh, uh, to this, as I, I I think I mentioned in one of my slides here. Yes. Okay, here. Okay. Any other question? So one another point I did not understand in the previous slide uh, point, the lead independent director point you mentioned. Yes. 
Yes, I did not get that very clearly. Independent director. Lead independent director. There was one point in the slide. Uh, can you help me with the? Was it like part of the recap or part of today? I think it was part of the recap. Part of the recap. Okay, let's go to the recap. Here somewhere. Uh, yes, sir. The, the the third point. The third point, independent director. No, the lead independent director. Or oh, the lead independent director. Okay. So the point is, if a CEO, CEO is what? CEO is actually executive. This guy is working for the company and gets salary, right? So this guy is an insider. Inside, right? So let's say if this guy is working on the board of director, he or she is not independent because they're also performing their executive role. Okay. But there is a research which establishes that if a CEO is also chairman of the board, it has a positive impact on performance of the company. So that's a good side, positive. The negative is since board of director, chair, chairman of the board, they convene or let's say uh, uh, meetings, right? So they decide about the timing of the meeting, board, board of directors meeting. And the board of director is also supposed to monitor performance of the management, performance of management okay so let's say let's focus on this one this one individual point so the board of a director is supposed to monitor the performance of the management so how can a board whose chairman is the current executive independently monitor the performance of the board right they can but the chances are that the board of director chairman can actually influence that uh, monitoring process, right? So one of the positive was good performance. The negative is there is a compromise on the supervisory role, okay? So what did, uh, I mean, companies did in, in, uh, in the US, they introduced the role of lead independent director. So these directors are those individuals who actually calls for executive sessions. So in these executive sessions, executives are absent, right? Now, if you see CEO, although he or she is chairman of the board, but because of the executive session, he or she cannot sit in these sessions, right? So, and of course, this session has to be headed by someone. Someone has to lead this, uh, uh, this uh, session, right? So that the director who is leading that session is called lead independent director, okay? And in those executive sessions, they can openly discuss the performance of the company because the CEO is not sitting on that uh, session. Right. Right, so that's the importance of lead independent director. So what they did, they're happy with the current structure. They would like to keep CEO as a chairman because it has a positive impact on performance, but at the same time, it compromises their monitoring role, right? So in order to address this part, the supervisory role, what they did, they introduced the concept of lead independent director. Yes, Is that sir. Clear thank, for those now? thank you, sir, thank you. You are very welcome. Any other question? Okay. So I will take that as a no. So no questions. Yes. Okay. Anyways, if you have any questions, you have my email address. Uh, but I will respond, in my opinion, more promptly to my WhatsApp messages. Okay. If you have any questions, any concerns, uh, or any 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 good joke, even joke are welcome actually on that group. Uh, use WhatsApp group, please. The reason is. If you have like good question, 
we will of course uh, discuss it uh, on the group and then your other colleagues can also benefit from it uh what i'll do tonight actually i'll uh, work on the project that i'm thinking for you guys i will uh, discuss that with uh, you tomorrow so we'll spend like close to 30 minutes discussing that project uh mashallah everybody in uh, your group is like pretty intelligent i'm very very happy with that uh so let's say if i give you a project prove me right i have a very good opinion of you guys theek okay? hai so prove me right theek okay? hai you have to work uh, hard for that project and you have to in my opinion come up, come up with uh, let's say the kind of work which we can we, we can potentially let's say with let's say 40 or 30% of let's say more refinement more let's say regular to it we can publish it put it that way so let's say if you are working hard work hard in a way which will benefit you in your future as well because let's say if you come up with an ordinary work i will dump it somewhere and you will also dump it somewhere yes you will get credit for that but in the long run you wouldn't uh, benefit from it so let's work hard on that one uh i'm sure you have also some other subjects but since you are working only full time on uh, your study so i hope that you will make uh, good use of your time so i thank you very much for your attention uh it, it is almost 2 hours so i apologize uh for the extra 20 minutes i wish you all the best and i'll see you inshallah tomorrow all the best allah hafiz thank you sir thank over you over and out yes allah hafiz <laughs>